posterity's sake, going to record the, the comments that we get tonight so we can in integrate those in. But Does it look like we're set? Okay. Good. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Clark, and um, I'm the Community Development Director here for the City of Grants Pass. And... Um, we are having the uh, second community forum related to our housing needs analysis. Um, we had one back in January and um, we had a hybrid kind of approach then as well, where we, we had some folks here in the chambers um, and then uh, kind of a majority of folks actually online. So that's what we have here tonight. So uh, we have some people joining us in both places. Um, one of the things that happened between one of the things that happened between the January forum and tonight um, is a community survey that that was uh, distributed around the community that was asking folks for input on uh, what's called middle housing, uh, kind of that housing type that is, you know, like triplexes, quads, cottage housing, kind of that. Uh, missing middle, so to speak, between kind of your big apartment complexes and your single family housing. Um, and uh, so that survey, along with some other types of questions was put out. And uh, so that's the first thing that we're gonna do tonight is kind of talk about what did that survey say? What are some of the results and what can we maybe learn from that? Um, and then uh, we're gonna get a little bit more detail from our uh, consultants that are assisting the city with this project on the housing needs analysis itself. Um, and then we're going to be talking about housing policies um, and some code updates. So um, Steve Faust is with uh, uh, 3J Consulting, um, and they're a, a consulting firm up in the Portland area that specializes in, in planning and um, uh, some analysis with GIS and, and uh, other planning. We also have Christina with, with uh, 3J as well. And then we have uh, Tim Woods with us tonight. He's uh, with FCS Group. And they provide more on the economic side of, of the housing issue and demographic analysis and things like that. So um, those are the folks we're going to hear from. And um, I guess with that, I will just turn it over to you, Steve, so you can kind of finish out the welcome and uh, kick us off. Thank you, Brad. And thanks, everyone who has joined us. Uh, as Brad mentioned, back at the end of January, we uh, had our first public meeting for this project, but we also uh, added in a conversation about rent burden in Grants Pass. Um, so we kind of had three topics, the, the rent burden topic, the housing needs analysis, and our proposed code updates. At our project that and, and the two elements that we'll be talking about tonight are the code uh, proposed code updates at least a, we'll touch on that just a little bit uh, but the main focus tonight is the housing needs analysis and uh, draft housing policies but before we do that um, at the as brad mentioned i think at the end of the last meeting we we introduced some code uh, update concepts related to middle housing uh, these are code updates that are required um, to some degree uh, by House Bill 2001, which was passed a few years ago. So we're working with the city to make code updates related to middle housing, which uh, according to House Bill 2001 refers to duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, uh, townhomes, and cottage cluster housing. So we introduced those housing types at the last public meeting and then uh, provided this online survey for those who were interested. And I'm just, before we get to the housing needs analysis and housing policies, we wanted to make sure to report back to the community on what we heard through that survey. <clears throat> so the survey was open from January 26th to February 17th, um, almost a month. And we had 207 respondents, which is pretty good in our experience uh, for a survey like this. Um, just <clears throat> for reference, our scale, we asked about the importance of several uh, different elements related to to help guide us as we develop as we develop, because we're still in process, these code updates. 
And so <clears throat> from uh, what I'm about to report, you'll see that the higher scores mean that people found them more important and the lower scores less important. <clears throat> so the first uh, question we asked were, <clears throat> excuse me, is was just uh, what should the top policy goals be for introducing middle housing zoning standards? So introducing these new, uh, not new, but these housing types that have not been a focus of development uh, across Oregon and really across the country um, previously. And you can see uh, we got some high scores for really making housing more affordable, which is what this is about. <clears throat> Middle housing is not necessarily about subsidized affordable housing, but about uh, removing barriers to these middle housing types that might provide smaller, more affordable units uh, for more, more people and households in Grants Pass. Uh, creating more rental opportunities also received a high score. Uh, creating opportunities for a broader variety of housing types and creating more opportunities for home ownership. Um, all, all these, and really <laughs> across the board, everything received uh, pretty high scores, including um, ensuring that middle housing is compatible with existing development. Even though that appeared at the bottom of the list, it still was a pretty popular concept among those who responded to the survey. And that really is the goal with these uh, middle housing types being introduced to single family zones is that <clears throat> they can be designed in a way where they fit in with single family detached dwellings. So um, a lot of support for a variety of elements uh, uh, and policy goals related to middle housing. The second question was uh, regarding duplexes. And one thing that House Bill 2001 uh, requires is that any regulations that a city has for single family detached dwellings, or I'm sorry, that it applies uh, to duplexes must also be applied to single family detached dwellings. So knowing that that's the case, we asked about what um, standards are important as we develop these uh, uh, changes to the code. And one uh, at the top, the top scoring item was allowing attached and detached configurations. So both uh, a duplex where the two units are attached in one um, structure, as well as where they are two detached units on one parcel. Um, and I realize it's a little hard maybe to visualize some of these concepts, but in the survey itself, we had a lot of photos to help um, visualize these things. Um, less, uh, there was less support for things like uh, modifying setbacks and lot coverage standards to allow for more units reducing minimum lot sizes to allow for more duplexes, limiting the overall size of buildings. Um, these still received, uh, the, you know, fell in the, um, you know, didn't fall down to the not important range or somewhat important, but not as high scoring as allowing those attached and detached uh, configurations. People did not find it to be very important to add a requirement for a garage or a carport. Um, I'll move on to the next one. Um, similar, similar questions as we go throughout. So this one is regarding triplexes and quadplexes and what, what are important standards to consider. Um, one thing, uh, the highest scoring one was that, that people uh, suggested um, addressing the location of parking areas relative to the, to the street and dwellings. We know that um, when you have three or four units on a site, there's different ways to provide parking, whether it's through garages or um, surface parking. So that's one thing to consider. Again, allowing attached and detached configurations, um, you know, all the way down to limiting the overall size of buildings. Uh, same question regarding townhouses, code, code standards that are important for townhouses, and really similar answers. Um, looking at parking relative to the street and dwellings, um, regulating the minimum and maximum number of units on a, uh, in a single building or in a single development. So that's uh, one to consider. Um, creating visual and physical connections between dwellings in the street. Then down on the lower end, things like limiting the overall size of buildings and adding architectural detailing standards to differentiate units. Um, I'll keep going, but, but just some observations overall is that folks were really, again, going back to that first slide, supportive of 
you know, measures that are going to help make these um, make uh, more affordable units available and more, um, you know, more rental units and more um, home ownership opportunities. And I think that's consistent throughout all these slides. Regarding cottage cluster code standards, um, providing options for shared parking or parking close to each cottage was important to folks. Um, again, modifying setbacks and lot coverage standards to allow for more units was important. And then down on the not important was uh, orienting cottages around a shared courtyard area and limiting the overall size of buildings. Um, so I'll pause here and see if there are any questions um, about the results of that survey, but just um, we are, you know, we take that, that information into consideration as we begin to prepare our proposed uh, updates to the grants pass development code. And that's how we're using the results of that of those of that survey. So, Brad, do we have uh, any questions? Um, at this point, we don't have anyone online, but we do have um, an individual here in the forum. So, yeah, please come on up. And uh, as long as the little red light is on on that microphone, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, is it? Just don't be afraid to step right up to it. Yep. Hi, my name's Amber, and I was wondering why we are not also asking these questions about standard apartment complexes. Good question. Uh, the <clears throat> the main purpose of of this project, and I should we should mention that this project received funding grant funding from the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, and it's really to implement the provisions of House Bill 2001, which focused specifically on those middle housing types, uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes, and cottage clusters. So that, that's really why this project was funded by the state and, and its specific purpose is to implement the provisions of House Bill 2001, um, hopefully in a way that best fits uh, the city of Grants Pass. Brad, anything to add to that? Yeah, I will just add that the while we have this project going on there, the city also has kind of a parallel thing going on right now to, to look at apartments and multi-dwelling complexes, um, particularly kind of the design of them, the, the amount of open space, both public open space and private open space that is required. So if somebody had developers to come in and build a new one, what do those design standards look like? Um, so that ordinance actually um, had one public hearing at the Planning Commission last month, um, and then it has a public hearing again at the City Council um, coming up here soon. And um, I will find that date because um, I don't have it memorized, but it's it's coming up. So, um, but yeah, that's a we're you know there's sort of multiple approaches to the housing crisis that the city's trying to do right now, and and. Uh, that one is more of a design oriented thing um, and it does deal with parking, it deals with landscaping, it deals with, like I mentioned, open space. So I, uh, I'll give you the date on that city council meeting, um, at maybe at the next question period so that anybody who's interested can know, know about that. <coughs> Thanks, Brad. So, anybody else? Okay, we have uh, no one else raising their hand here in, in the chambers. Okay, Brad, I should also say that um, while those code updates uh, are really focused on middle housing. The other part of this project that uh, Tim's going to talk to us about is the housing needs analysis and then uh, our proposed housing policies. And those really, those also do pertain a lot more to um, all types of housing uh, in Grants Pass and not just middle housing. So we'll get to that in just a little bit, but I'll hand it over to Tim to talk about the housing needs analysis. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Tim Wood. Um, been working with this uh, FCS group for, for quite a while on housing projects and um, so really happy to be working with Grants Pass on, on this iteration of their housing needs analysis. So if we could get to the next slide, there we go. So um, <clears throat> the question is, what is a housing needs analysis and uh, why is it relevant to the overall housing burdens that, that exist in Grants Pass? The state of Oregon requires that cities um, periodically review their buildable land for housing purposes and then also project future need for housing into, uh, into about a 20-year time frame. Uh, this is a part of the, the greater 
land use framework that's been developed in the state of Oregon over the last several decades. Uh, housing needs analysis is, as most state law is, very prescriptive. So it's essentially a measurement of supply and demand. Uh, the housing needs projection, which is one required element of a housing needs analysis, measures demand, which is basically just how many housing units are we going to need in 20 years. The buildable land inventory measures the supply of residential land uh, and, and just gives us a sense of how much buildable residential land is there to meet the demand that we've determined uh, in the housing needs projection. And then finally, the residential land needs analysis uh, is, is sort of fusing those two together to determine do we have enough land to meet supply based on what we know about the housing market in Grants Pass. And more broadly, it's a great opportunity to look at the housing market in a given city at a particular time. And so not only are we going to address the issue of supply versus demand uh, with regards to land, we'll also measure, we'll, we'll also take an opportunity to look at, at the greater ecosystem of housing in a community and recommend policies for addressing other issues that we might have come, come across in our analysis. So it kind of gives you a sense of why we're doing this in the first place. So let's skip to the next slide. And we'll talk about the housing needs projection, which is that first element of uh, a housing needs analysis. So this is a, largely a measurement of where we stand as a community um, with regards to housing. So. The first thing that we think of as economists is, well, what does the market look like presently? So um, this is a good overview here. It shows the breakdown, the structural breakdown of all housing units in Grants Pass and, and just the share that those represent of the overall uh, housing environment. So you can see that two thirds of all units in Grants Pass are single family detached, which is very standard statewide. And then townhomes represent 17%. Um, of, of housing units, 11% uh, are in multifamily, and then 6% are in mobile home and other. And I should note that townhomes and plexes are more traditionally those middle housing. So we'll we'll be talking a lot about those in particular, but you can see that already Grants Pass is a pretty healthy mix of townhomes and plexes in my experience statewide. That's a, that's a pretty good number. So um, there's already a lot of precedent for that kind of housing in Grants Pass, which is exciting to start from. So we'll go to the next one and dive a little deeper into how the housing market looks. And this is among all occupied housing units, how many of those units are owner occupied versus renter occupied. And that's a really important thing to think about as we move forward. Uh, are we building for future uh, consumers of housing in Grants Pass? So if we are, then, then we have to focus on where they, where they tend to be. So as you can see here, the darker blue bar that, that makes up the bottom half of these bars is owner occupied. So you can see, for example, in single family detached, most of the single family detached housing in Grants Pass is owner occupied. The renter occupied is that lighter green shade that makes up the top half of these bars. So you can see that while uh, there is a significant amount of renter occupied units in the, the single family detached space, there's a lot more, they're, they're a lot more likely to end up in townhomes and, and multifamily and, and plexes. That's just the, the way that we see the market moving. And you can see also here that mobile home and other is predominantly owner occupied. So that's just really important to note as we go forward. So that brings us to this table, which shows the breakdown of these housing types uh, by ownership. So you can see that on that first column from the left there, among owner occupied dwelling units, nearly 90% of all owner occupied dwelling units are single family detached homes. So most people who own their home live in a single family detached home. You can compare that to renter occupied and you see it's a much bigger split. It's still predominantly single family, but you can see that townhomes, plexes and multifamily make up a big chunk of that space of the market as well. And then the next column over, we're seeing vacant units be introduced here. And that's an important element of the housing uh, ecosystem as well. You can see that 5.6% of all units in Grants Pass are vacant, and that's pretty standard too statewide. Those are vacant for any number of reasons. For example, maybe they're um, vacation rentals or they're, they're vacant simply because they're in between tenants. So among those uh, multifamily, that 9.1% of the vacant units that are multifamily could just be that 
there at the time that the survey was taken there there wasn't a renter in that place at that time so 5.6 percent is is again pretty standard nothing to to be too concerned about but important to note um and you can see over to the right that's that's also that breakdown that we looked at at the pie chart so the same the same breakdown there so let's skip to the next so that gives us a sense for what the market looks like. Now we're thinking a little bit more about what does the demand look like moving forward. And here this graph is um, a little bit complex, so we'll walk through it together. That top line, that's just Josephine County. So we're we're seeing that population increase steadily, um, and, and that's good to see. The bottom two lines, you'll see that we had the city of Grants Pass there from 2000 to 2019. And that's just the data that's available from the census. Um, so you see, again, pretty healthy population growth uh, within the city of Grants Pass. And then from 2020 onward, we're looking at the urban growth boundary of Grants Pass, and that's because that's a state requirement that we use uh, Portland State University Population Research Center growth rates to determine population growth going forward. So inside of the, ur uh, the urban growth boundary for Grants Pass, we see just about 10,000 additional people projected from 2020 to 2040. So that answers a really important question of this process, which is how many people do we need to plan for in the next 20 years? So we see it's about 10,000, a little under 10,000. So let's go to the next. Now, going back to the market real quick, let's, let's take a, a quick look at group quarters populations. This is a very um, esoteric element of this analysis, but it's important to note because this is planning for populations that are in things like um, congregate care facilities, dormitories, prisons, that kind of thing. So not traditional housing units. So this this kind of falls outside of the realm of uh, you know single family detached or multifamily or whatever else. So this is kind of like one little takeoff that we can take from that population and you'll see this come back uh, in a little bit. So yeah, there we go. And the, the, another really important element of the market is what is the average household size? That that plays a really key role in the calculation of demand going forward. And you can see here that in Grants Pass over the last 18 years, it's been very steady, about 2.3, between 2.3, 2.4 four basically people per household which again pretty standard you can see that that mimics josephine county very closely so this gets to one of the key numbers in this whole analysis which is how many housing units do we need to prepare for going forward so you can see that this table brings in a lot of the data that we just looked at so there at the top we're seeing the urban growth boundary population and we just saw that that line and so of course we see that uh, the change there on the far right column is just about 10,000, 9,401. Uh, then we take off a little bit for group quarters population, which represents about 2.7% of the Grants Pass population overall. So essentially we get to subtract out that 2.7% or 252 there. Uh, I should note that I'm mainly looking at the far right column since that's relevant for the analysis. Um, so that leaves us with about 9,150 people who live in traditional housing that we have to account for. So bringing back that average household size metric, we divide that 9,150 by 2.39 to end up with 3,828 year round households. And then bringing back that vacancy factor, we add in another 227 additional housing units to come up with about 4,055 traditional housing units that we need to plan for in the next 20 years for Grants Pass. So that's a big finding. And that breaks down and we will bring back that that kind of ownership breakdown table that we were looking at before. And you'll see that that we've tweaked it a little bit to recognize that in all likelihood the future demand those in, in, in essence those additional 4,000 uh, 55 units will look a little bit different than the existing conditions. So we expect slightly more renter occupied, slightly less owner occupied and about the same vacant. And you can see there on the far right column that we 
At the top there, that's the 4,055 additional housing units that we're going to need to add. Among those, this is the breakdown that we expect it to look like, still predominantly single family detached. 2,500 of those 4,000 units is going to be in single family detached. And then to, to round that out, we've got about 750 townhomes and plexes, 550 multifamily, and then about 250 manufactured homes and others. Um, so that's kind of the big takeaway from this element of the analysis. It's the breakdown of what the housing units will look like coming out. That's the future demand that we need to plan for going forward. So let's skip to the next. So that's that answers the demand side. So now we have to consider the supply side and that that's the buildable land inventory. Now, 3J did a lot of this analysis and they did a really good job. They adhered to the Oregon administrative rules that dictate how a buildable land inventory ought to be done and essentially just includes land that's zoned residential and can accommodate development. So something that we expect could be served by infrastructure in the next 20 years and is vacant and not at a 25% or greater slope. So we've got a lot of, of kind of qualifiers that we'll, we'll break down a little bit further for you as, as I go on in this presentation. But that's that's the goal of the buildable land inventory at a, at a 30,000 foot view. And again, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into the weeds here as we go forward. So generally speaking, the methodology is we determine the gross area and we classify that 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 area, all of the parcels inside of the, the urban growth boundary based on data like assessors data, GIS layers of, of assessors data and um, improvement value, that kind of thing. And then we determined uh, the constrained land area. So take, for example, slopes, I know that's a big deal or for example, wetlands or or floodplains. And then finally, um, going to look at it by by zoning to kind of determine what density that property can can accommodate. So we'll get a little bit further into that. And this is a slide that shows that process a little bit more uh, visually. So again, we're taking that data there at the far left and we're determining level of development whether it's vacant or not, essentially, and then reducing the amount of vacant land because of floodplains or uh, parks and open spaces or other things that might disqualify a property from being developable. And then finally calculate the net buildable land so that we can determine what is the buildable land inventory for Grants Pass. And I'll spare you a lot of these details, but suffice it to say that there's a, a good amount of, of detail that goes into how we determine what is what. It's mostly assessor's data. So I think the most important thing to recognize is we classify those properties uh, vacant, which have less than $10,000 in improvement value, according to the assessor, and are greater than 5,000 square feet. So essentially a property that's big enough to be built on and which doesn't have enough built on it yet to make it not developable. Other relevant classifications are partially vacant, so that's that's a parcel that has is greater than 10,000 square feet and has and has a structure on it, but could potentially be subdivided or otherwise used for for residential purposes. And uh, and then we get into vacant undersized, and those are essentially the same conditions for vacant, so improvement value of less than 10,000, but the lot size is less than 5,000 square feet, so it's essentially too small to be developed. A developed lot is simply one that has a, a large improvement value, and so we kind of figure that those aren't going to those aren't going to develop. Uh, unbuildable or constrained, those are ones that are overwhelmed by slope or other um, hazards that would make it undevelopable, or potentially those lands that aren't zoned for residential under any circumstances, so think industrial land. Uh, oh, I guess that that's employment. So that's that's the way that we break down. That's the first step of the buildable inventory is just to essentially classify every parcel inside of Grants Pass to figure out which ones are we. What's the universe of parcels that we're really interested in? And this is the answer to that question. So essentially, there's 
four major land use types in grants passed that we considered to be residential. Um, that's HR, HRR, LR, and MR. And about 80% of that has already been developed, which is that far left column there, the developed column. So of the total of 5,670 acres of residential land, 4,640 are already developed. So they're, they're pretty much off the table. So we've got 1,031 acres left to analyze. That's still a really good amount of, of acreage. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're looking pretty good right off the bat. And then we, we take a look at two other reduction factors, one of which is exempt land. So think something that's owned by the school district or the parks department or some other entity that won't want to develop it for residential uses. It's a small amount, about 240 in, in grants pass. The other element that we need to deduct for is environmental constraints. And so that's the slope or floodplain or wetland. And that's also 290. So taken together, that's a pretty significant chunk of that 1,031 acres that we started off with, which we thought those are vacant and buildable. So that leaves us with about 500 acres or so left after reducing for um, exempt or otherwise constrained property. So about 50% reduction <laughs> from, from these reductions. Finally, we, we land on that vacant buildable. So we, we take that 500 from that previous table that's that's been reduced by all of those other factors, and we have to allocate about 25% of that land for future public uses, for example, roads or schools or parks, things that will be necessary to accommodate residential development going forward. So we're left with about 370 acres of buildable residential land, which is still a really good number. Additionally, we take consideration of those part vacant parcels as well. And that's a that's also really, really big in, in Grants Pass. So this is that same table that we saw on the prior slide, only with partially vacant. So we start with a universe of about a thousand acres of partially vacant property. And after allocating that 25%, or about 250, 260 acres, we're left with 778 acres of partially vacant land. So the universe of developable land is pretty large for Grants Pass, um, both vacant greenfield development and part vacant potentially subdividable land as well. And this is the, the, the kind of geographic representation of that. So I want to make sure that we do as good a job as we can to show you all where that land is. So I'll try my best to navigate you through this. You see that down there on the bottom left of this slide, you've got the different land use designations. So HRR is the darkest of the colors, HR, orange, MR, yellow, and LR, kind of that beigey color. And importantly, those properties that are highlighted here that have that that crosshatch, those are part vacant. So there is there is development on that property, but it's it's we think that it's subdividable. So you can see that there's a good distribution of vacant and part vacant in this southwestern chunk of the Grants Pass urban growth boundary. So plenty of of potentially developable land there, and we're going to kind of go around. Uh, the different quadrants of the of the urban growth boundary to make sure that you, you get a good sense of where we think there is developable land. So on the northern end, less uh, less visually apparent developable land, but still a good a good amount, especially there along I five, and then kind of a little towards the center there. We've got a lot of higher density residential land that's partially vacant there, uh, just north of what looks like ninety nine or one ninety nine. Um, and additionally, you'll see in this one. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. What are those plan designations? Um, Stand by. Actually, Brad, Brad, can you can you can you spring me on this one? 
Um, which which one are you talking about? Oh, the, the various plan designations, the the HR, HRR. So they're basically, uh, you know, uh, high density residential, medium density residential, and 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 uh, and lower residential. Right. In the in the comp plan, so yeah, the darker orange being, you know, the highest, um, up to like, uh, you know, above thirty five units per acre, and then it comes down to where you come more of smaller amounts. Thank you. So, in addition, you'll notice here that there's a lot of this gray over towards the west and in the south. Those are those environmental uh, constraints, so slope or, and especially towards the south there, you'll notice that the, the constraint follows the river quite a bit, so that we can assume is floodplain. Uh, but there's probably a lot of slope there to the west. So let's go to the next quadrant. So this is the southeast of the urban growth boundary, and you can see down there at the south, there's a lot of medium density residential uh, that's part vacant, even some parcels that are fully vacant. And then towards the center there, we've got a little bit more higher density residential, and again, mostly part vacant, but still some pretty significant chunks of, of vacant land in there as well. And then finally, we're looking at the central elements of the city, and that's, uh, you know, again, we've got a good mix in here of partially vacant, fully vacant, and and at varying densities as well. So there's a there's a good distribution all over the city, and that's what we like to see in a buildable land inventory. So the final number of buildable land uh, in Grants Pass is that 373 acres of vacant land and 778 of partially vacant, which means leaves a total of about 1,150 acres of total buildable residential land, uh, which is a lot. Um, so that's a great outcome. Uh, we don't we don't tend to see that very frequently, and you can see that this distribution is is pretty even as well, even among the highest density. Um, residential land, the HRR, you've got plenty both in vacant and partially vacant. So that's a really good outcome. Uh, we, we, we really like to see that. And finally, we'll take a look at the land sufficiency analysis or residential land need analysis. So that's where we fuse the two analyses together. So essentially, we're estimating the amount of buildable land that we're going to need to accommodate the housing unit growth between 2020 and 2040. So we're taking a look at the housing needs projection that that demand figure that we that we determined earlier about 4000 new traditional dwelling units we're going to need. And then we're going to take a look at the the land amounts that we just that we just determined from the buildable land inventory and then reconcile the two based on average density of development in Grants Pass. So we'll take a look at how that analysis played out. And this is where we're juxtaposing demand with maximum density. So here you'll see on the, the far left column, the 20 year dwelling unit demand. That's the same numbers that we were looking at from the, um, the demand projection. So again, about 2,500 single family, 750 townhomes and plexes, 250 manufactured homes and then 551 units of multifamily. And then down there at the bottom, we're, we're taking a look at that group quarters amount as well, just to make sure that we're accounting for that. So that's again, folks in congregate care or dorms or, or other non-traditional dwelling units. And so the next column over, those are the applicable plan designations. So there, as you can see, the LR, the lower density residential, that's going to meet the need for single family detached, whereas as we go for townhomes, plexes, and, and other sorts, we're, we're looking at those higher density designations of land use. Um, taking a look at the way that development has occurred in applicable local zones, we're moving over to the allowable density. So that's this, this range that we see here at about the middle columns. So we're seeing among that single family detached um, category, about four to six units per acre among townhomes and plexes, that's looking more like 8.7 to 12.4.
manufactured back down to six to 12 and then multifamily 20 to 50. So that's really important when we're considering how much of the demand that we've determined, how much of that far left column can we accommodate on the buildable land where that we have identified already. So that all the way on the far right column, you can see that's how much land we project you're going to need to in, in each of these plan designations to meet the demand going forward. And so you're going to need about 674 acres in total, but obviously among those plan designations, the, the demand varies. So the next table will show us kind of the answer to the question, do you have enough buildable land? And the answer is yes, in all categories you do, which is great news. So again, we're bringing in that 674 uh, buildable land requirement, and you can see that it's broken down by the various plan designations. Um, and then the next column over shows um, the buildable land inventory. So you can see that in each of those plan designations, there's more than enough uh, supply to meet the demand. And over to the far right, that's your surplus. So going forward, you even have an additional 478 acres in total uh, that, that you'll have going going beyond 2040. So it's, it's a pretty great outcome in this housing needs analysis. It's not typically this smooth, but uh, we're happy to report that it's quite smooth. So uh, that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions from anybody in attendance today. Yeah, back to your slide, um, net buildable land in need. Back about two slides. Yeah, so it says um, second column on the right, Average development density. Uh, what what average is that? So that's state the state average. Oh, sorry, no, that's local. That's so you so that's the that's local in Grants Pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's among so, those those residential so land use types. Okay, so that makes me think you have a you have a, an idea of the number of units that actually exist in Grants Pass. Can, yes. Can I, in, can I infer that? So you know how many units exist in Grants Pass? We have census estimates that get us close. Um, I I wouldn't say that I have a down to the very last number detailed inventory of, of housing units because that number shifts on a daily basis. But um, yes, we, we have we have census estimates that, that get us pretty close. So you, you OK, so you can tell us right now how many units exist in Grants Pass? With, as of 2018. With, as of 2018, okay. Yes. So then we can determine from that then how far in the hole we are right now, how far behind we are in our housing needs currently. I, relative to, relative to what I guess would be my, my question. In terms of in terms of like affordable units that that would need to be developed to meet like existing demand, um, I, let let me tell you what my thoughts are here on this, and then you tell me how the data would, would answer this question. In order for us to say we need to build a, a thousand more units over the next ten years, I'm going to use round numbers here. Um, <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, that assumes we're starting at at zero or a, or a or an appropriate spot today, but we're not. We're behind. We we have one of the hurt, worst housing markets on on the west coast, in our town. So we need to know how far behind we are to serve the current population. To know that we need to build a thousand plus two hundred to make up for our current deficit, or we need to build a thousand plus five hundred to make up for our current de deficit, and that knowing what our current deficit is, we haven't seen that yet. Um, at least I haven't seen it yet in any of these presentations you've given us. Is mm -hmm. there a way of knowing what our current deficit is? It's it's a much it's a really good question, and it's one that I I would struggle to answer definitively. But I I will talk to. Um, my colleagues to see if if there's any other way that we can give you a good answer to that question. But I think that the 
the best answer based on what we've done so far is there's a big amount of demand in Grants Pass in general. I mean, 4,000 dwelling units over 20 years is a lot uh, relative to most of the communities that I've worked in. So. Hey, Tim. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you because uh, I just need to ask if somebody who is uh, listening in uh, is either in the kitchen or uh, is working on something and we can hear it in the background. If, uh, if you could just mute your phones uh, unless you're speaking, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I'd just say that, that the most important thing that, that's the outcome here is that you have a great deal of demand that needs to be met. And that that number, that 4,055 number is, is significant. And, and in terms of addressing a deficit, I think that, that that speaks to an existing deficit already because it's, it's a lot. That's, that's, a, that's a big number um, for a community like Grants Pass. So, but I, I'm gonna do my best to answer that question definitively and get you something inside of that report that addresses the notion of deficit because I know it's important. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, is that, all right. I have a couple questions and um, some of these might be answered by the first guy that was speaking. Uh, the, the first question is when you're talking about environmental damage is fire danger. We've been seeing a lot of, uh, I mean, Phoenix and talent burned down last year. Cities, actual cities burned down is fire danger, uh, at, at least going to be applied to environmental damages. I don't think so. Um, simply because it's not something that the state's required that we look at and it's hard to it's hard to estimate where the fire danger would be so significant. Um, I think that that's a really good point though and it's something that I think DLCD ought to give us a good comment on and I'll and I'll I'll yeah. effort to make sure that we we get a comment uh -huh. on that. Well, it, it just seems that you could look at, you know, not this is a follow up to my own question, because I guess that's how this goes. But you could um, look, could you not just look at where the fires have been springing up and look for, do the scientific thing of look for data that aligns up and say, OK, these are the most likely the places that are going to be fire danger. Um, I, I don't know. Um, can you like can can you do something like go and make sure that like just as simple as making sure there isn't brush that can easily be burned in these properties? We live in a very nature friendly area. Anyway, I don't want to get uh, too lost on that. Um, when it comes to these new houses, are things like internet? going to be included in the infrastructure in these houses are we are we building just empty shells are we actually building good communities that have infrastructure like internet look at look at how many people are online in this meeting right now you can't like this our our little town has never really had the best internet especially for people who live in the surrounding areas i live in hugo and I do not have reliable internet at all. And it's made me not get the, the, the simple fact that I can't, I can't get a job that relies on the internet because I do not have reliable internet. Is that something that's included in all this housing crisis? I'd, I'd mostly defer to Christina or Steve on that, but my, my take is that Generally, when we're when we're including lands, it's it's lands that we expect to be served by infrastructure in the next 20 years. But Steve, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, let me try to address both of those those questions because they're really important. Um, I think regard regarding fire hazard, um, <clears throat> I think there there's two aspects to to answer your question. One is um, if 
if data sets are currently available that show areas of fire hazard, um, we'd be happy to take a look at those and include some sort of qualitative um, discussion of those. Um, I know that DLCD in recent years has, even before this most recent <clears throat> year of tragic fires, has been investing more funding in helping communities develop um, uh, planning plans around fire hazards. Um, I don't know that that information is fully developed yet, but if we had a data set that showed us kind of areas of fire danger, that's something that we could show qualitatively. But the, the second part of that is what Tim mentioned in terms of that is not something that we can use to, re according to state statute, use to remove land from our inventory. And I would hope that uh, the state's moving in that direction and we'll see some progress in that area in the, the near future. But for the time being, um, we're, you know, for the exercise of, of preparing a buildable lands inventory, we're not allowed to remove um, areas based on that category. So that's the answer to that question. Um, okay. And then your second question was about, yeah, yeah. Um, this exercise of a housing needs analysis is really focused on um, identifying what the need is in terms of the number of housing units over the next 20 years and how that equates to land, and then making sure that the city has enough land available to meet that demand. It's, it is really an exercise of in land use, but it does provide us the opportunity to take a look at uh, the city's housing policies and other efforts that the city has underway in, in terms of um, you know, how housing is developed and where growth happens over time. So um, I think you'll see when we get to housing policies, we actually have um, uh, policy related to infrastructure. We have a lot of policies related to different aspects of housing across the board. Um, um, and that's really where we have an opportunity to make a difference in that arena. Brad, I think Brad, uh, you know, I don't know, Brad, if you have anything to add um, in terms of specifically internet infrastructure in the city, um, things of that nature. But really, once, you know, once we set the policies and uh, I mentioned, you know, we implement policies through development code, those along with, uh, you know, incentives and a few other regulatory uh, tools are what we are what are what the city has at its, as, at its disposal to influence how growth and development happens. And after that, it's really up to property owners and developers to determine um, where, where, where things happen. But Brad, do you want to say anything about infrastructure, whether it's, it's internet infrastructure or other? Um, sure, I, just a couple things. I mean, if you live in the Hugo area, then I can see why you're talking about fire, because uh, uh, if you look at the hotspots map, um, of the entire state, the Merlin, Hugo North of here pops out uh, on the graphs as one of the most uh, risk areas. I was evacuated two years ago from my house. Yeah, yeah, no, so it's it totally, that's a, it's a very, very real threat. Um, you know, what we're talking about, we, we have developed wildfire um, uh, mapping here for the city of Grants Pass. Um, you know, you're obviously outside the city limits of Grants Pass, so we don't have that, but um for us we we have you know several of some maps that show where that is and and we're actually in discussions right now with city council about having new housing have some uh, some special standards maybe built in you know even little things like when you're uh you're putting gutters on that you put metal over the gutter so you don't get you know uh, yeah to, 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 like that so small things like that yeah and, you know you don't have to look at a map and you don't have to look at data to know that just like you said the gutters over the or the metal over the gutters prevents fires yeah yeah in terms of internet um the collaborative economic development committee um which is a collaborative committee of about i don't know 12 people it has people from the city on it people from the county on it people from uh, cave junction um they actually have been talking about broadband quite a bit over the last year and a half to two years and how to really, you know, elevate that um, and get it to uh, areas of need in particular outside the city of Grants Pass. So there is some work being done on that by some specialists um, in telecommunications. We don't, when we're talking about new housing, um, our, we 
you know, we know we as a city, since that's not a service that we provide, it's private sector provided, um, don't necessarily take a look at that to say, oh yeah, you know, you've got, you know, whatever, 5G here or not there. Um, but we're looking at water and sewer and stormwater and all that good stuff. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Um, and, and one more question if I'm not hogging from it. Okay. And this might just be a quick one. Is, is building all these new houses in any way designed to lower the amount of homeless people in the area? Are those two things related or is that a separate issue? I guess that's the end of that. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if, Steve, if you're going to touch on that in the housing policy section that's coming up right after this. Um, you know, it's on all of our minds. It's extremely important. And if you look at that whole continuum uh, from homeless, uh, unhoused population, you know, up, uh, there's, there's a need all along that whole stretch. Um, it's not a particular focus of, of this study, but that doesn't mean that it's not important to the city and that we're looking at it. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit in the housing policies. Um, I think you hit it right, Brad, that, you know, there's other city uh, discussions and initiatives to look at that issue. It's, but it's certainly not unrelated from what we're talking about today. Um, and especially, um, you know, what we'll be talking about <clears throat> uh, going forward in terms of uh, middle housing code updates. While those are not in any way designed to address the um, unhoused uh, po population, um, it is an effort to provide more affordable units for more families, and that has a trickle-down effect um, to some degree. It's it's a small part of, of, I mean, all this work we're doing in this project is a small part of what needs to be a very broad and comprehensive um, uh, effort to address the housing crisis that uh, we're seeing in Grants Pass and across the state. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more here. Um, no. uh, my name's Amber, and I one thing I'm I'm noticing is missing from this whole analysis is cost of the housing. Um, I feel like we're possibly shooting ourselves in the foot here by not addressing cost and possibly just preparing ourselves for the California exodus to just come in, snatch up these places, rent them out to us still, who's available, and leave us with the same amount of deficit we had before. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's absolutely true. And it's it's something that the state has done a pretty good job of requiring us to look at a little bit better. So in the document itself, there's there's some discussion of cost, and I think that that's also a, a bit more of a policy discussion as well. So it's I, I think Steve will probably touch on this a, li a little bit more, but it is it is very relevant for for the analysis. Of course, um, it's something that we need to we need to plan for. Was there any amount of analysis done on the income limits in the area, the income averages in the area, and who can afford to? rent or buy certain areas or not? Yes, yes, there have. There, there's in, in the document, there is some discussion of, of that. And in the final version, we're going to have more of a discussion of, of that than we have presently. So um, it's it's something that we're we're keenly aware of and we want to make sure that we we address to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Um, yeah, if I could just add, um, yeah, it, it is definitely important that um, as the city looks to encourage uh, housing development over time to meet that need that we're not just doing the overall number of units or even the, the housing types that you see here, but really making sure that housing is being produced at those different income levels and that the city is doing what it can, um, knowing that you know um, a lot of what happens is determined by, like we said, the, the, the market, the private market and, and property owners and developers. But, um, certainly important that the city does what it can to make sure that housing is being developed at different income levels uh, that are that's commensurate with uh, the the demographic the income profile 
of the city of Grants Pass. And and Brad, um, is the the draft housing needs analysis, is that posted uh, to the project website or somewhere that people can access it? Yeah, um, I need to check. I don't think it's up right now, um, but uh, we were kind of waiting for this forum so we could, you know, integrate some if, you know, new input and comments and then <clears throat> and then put it up. But uh, this presentation um, uh, will be up um, by Friday, as well as the last presentation. And then we'll uh, any anyone who contacts the the, the city with email. Um, we have a sign-in sheet here, but then there's also anybody you can contact uh, us with an email. We can send out notices of when the uh, website gets updated, and, and we'll have that on there in the future. Yeah, I, I apologize that we didn't have a few slides on, on income. Um, that's an oversight on our part. And uh, uh, Yeah, please work with Brad to get access to the document so you can see that information. Jason, did we have anyone online who would like to comment? Okay. Yeah, if anyone on on uh, online um, would like to comment, there's a chat box um, on the MS Teams app there on the screen, or of course you can um, you can also uh, use use your phone. We're uh, we're all live here, so um, I don't think at this point there's anyone. So Steve, if you want to do our last segment there. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about housing policy, so it's time to get to it. Um, <clears throat> I'll mention, well, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so we have uh, attempted to uh, update the city's housing goals, which uh, appear in the housing element of the city's comprehensive plan. And the city's goal, goal for housing is really based on the state goal related to uh, goal 10, which is a statewide goal for housing, <clears throat> excuse me, which is ensuring the availability of adequate numbers of needed housing units at price ranges and rent levels commensurate with the financial capabilities of Grants Pass households and allow for the flexibility of housing location, type, and density. Um, it's a mouthful, but that, that's really trying to say um, that the city should be working to make sure that there uh, are housing units available at the price ranges and in the locations and in the housing types that uh, can accommodate the people of Grants Pass. <clears throat> and so we started with the existing um, policies and did qu quite a bit of overhaul and we hope we're being comprehensive in these policies and we've divided them into land availability, uh, that should say housing needs, housing affordability and homelessness or houselessness, and funding and incentives. So I'm gonna go, I'll walk through these right now, and I'm sorry if the print is a little too small, but I've tried to underline the key concepts in each one, and I'm not gonna read them all, but um, I'll give a summary. So uh, this, first, this first set has to do with land availability. Uh, policy 9.1 is ensuring that the city has a 20 year supply of land to meet housing needs. Uh, the second is making sure to update the housing needs analysis on a regular basis. The third is, uh, you know, following this effort and, and, and any other key housing efforts, revising the comprehensive plan, uh, those land use designations and the development code to make sure we're aligned with and meeting the housing needs that are identified in the housing needs analysis. Uh, directing development opportunities toward those vacant and partially vacant uh, land or parcels that Tim went through a little bit earlier. And then maintaining uh, these tools that the city has, uh, including the land use map, the zoning map, overlay maps and development code so that people understand where different opportunities are um, to develop ho different housing types, uh, densities and, and, and densities within the urban growth boundary. So those are our five uh, policies related to land availability. Then there's a number here related to housing needs. Um, and I should say a version of these appears in the draft housing needs analysis. Um, Tim, let's make sure we uh, update those uh, before we uh, 
uh, after this meeting so Brad can post a, a more updated. I think the, the policies are an earlier version. So let's make sure we update the housing needs analysis with this most recent set of policies and get that to Brad. Um, so 9.6, and these are some specific, I should mention, and, and maybe Brad, you can expound on this, but um, we basically have developed these um, policy recommendations based on you know, what we learned from the housing needs analysis, uh, the effort that we have going on related to middle housing, uh, best practices for what we've uh, um, examined from other communities throughout the state. And then Brad, you have a group that's working on housing issues right now, and we incorporated some of that into this. Do you want to talk about that effort real quick, the action plan? Sure, yeah, and uh, Doug Walker, who's here tonight, is our chair of the Housing Advisory Committee for the city. Um, it's a group that was formed in 2017, uh, has about 12 members uh, cross-section across you know, various disciplines and housing and rent uh, people in the in, uh, landlords and um, the focus really is to kind of just, you know, talk about housing uh, need and policy in the city. Uh, they meet monthly. Um, there was a, an action plan that was created the last year, and uh, it's chock full of uh, different approaches, uh, you know, finance um, approaches, uh, development uh, issues, code issues. Um, so the, it's a document that um, is is on our website and anybody we can you know have it and share it and that the housing advisory committee has been working pretty diligently to uh, kind of prioritize that document. Um, um, it is not been formally adopted by the city council, um, but it was presented during uh, some strategic planning exercises in 2020 um, and uh, they it kind of, you know, acknowledged the, the, the document, kind of uh, put their blessing on it, if you will, at that meeting. And it's it's kind of been the working document. The council has requested uh, um, the priorities from the Housing Advisory Committee be presented to them. And so we're in the process of doing that right now. Thanks, Brad. Um, so back to these um, housing policies. Uh, 9.6 is to lower or remove local barriers to residential development. That's part of what we're doing through the middle housing project um, aspect of this project. Streamlining land use and development processes to uh, make sure that uh, developing housing is timely and efficient. Uh, permitting a variety of housing types across all residential zones. And it goes on to talk about specifically about middle housing types and housing types that are shown to, to have lower housing costs. And again, that's related to our middle housing, um, um, the middle housing aspect of this project. 9.9, um, .9, uh, creating pre-approved middle housing floor plans that encourage middle housing development. So pre-approved floor plans that developers can use and, and not go through uh, the same permitting process as um, as others would. Reducing minimum lot sizes in low density zones, that uh, helps increase the efficiency of single family and middle housing. Establishing minimum densities in medium and high density zones. So I, I believe right now, um, well, I, I don't know where the state of that effort is, Brad, but previously the city allowed, you know, all the way down to single family detached dwellings in medium and high density zones, which um, somewhat defeats the purpose of trying to um, encourage uh, more dense housing development in those medium and high density zones. So looking at mi minimum densities to um, help with that and increasing the maximum building height in higher density zones. Staying uh, in the category of housing needs, um, simplifying the permit process uh, to convert single family units in commercial zones to medium and high density uh, multi-dwelling housing. Um, supporting efforts by for-profit and non-profit entities to provide housing for special needs populations. Promoting and incentivizing mixed use areas where um, there are a variety of transportation options and services and commercial centers and recreation amenities all in, the, in a um, approximate location. Directing funds and program support to rehabilitate existing housing within Grants Pass planning infrastructure and utilities to support housing development uh, within the urban growth boundary, 
um, especially in areas that are likely for infill development. And that that's uh, so those are the policies that we identified to address those needs uh, from the housing needs analysis. The next category is housing affordability and houselessness. Um, partnering with public, private, and nonprofit agencies to facilitate affordable housing development and maintenance. This happens to give an example of purchasing affordable housing um, projects with income restricted sunset dates to so you can retain affordability into the future. That's just one example. Um, dedicating city resources to support, again, public and private housing and associated programs for community members experiencing houselessness. Permitting non-traditional housing in the city through adopting transitional housing accommodation codes. Identifying surplus publicly owned properties that could be used for affordable housing. I think those are the policies related to affordability and houselessness. And then we have our final category of funding and, and incentives, 9.20, consider a variety of incentives to support subsidized low income and workforce housing. Um, and there's a list of those uh, potential incentives there. And then um, identifying funding sources to increase housing affordability. Um, and we list a number of potential funding sources there as well from um, uh, construction excise tax, uh, short term rental lodging tax, uh, proceeds from sale of public properties, a variety of options there. And so now we'll move to take questions and really love to hear um, thoughts and comments about other policies that should be included. But I also want to take this opportunity to mention that we do have an online survey um, that is specifically uh, centered around these housing policies and um, showing people's whether, you know, uh, the level of support people have for these different policies. And then um, there are questions where you can also um, suggest additional policies. So I'd encourage people to take that survey and share this information with your networks so we can get as many people as possible to review and, and comment on these policies. And I'll show this link again at the end of the meeting. Um, so with that, I'd uh, love to take, quest take questions and um, hear comments about housing policies. Yeah, I've, I've got one um, comment and I'm not sure it really applies, but it, I think it needs to be addressed at some point um, if, if it gets moved up the chain of command from your end. But for housing supply, on increasing the number of um, trades persons and making it easier to be in that industry, I think is something the state needs to start working on, um, such as the number of uh, um, uh, Oh, I can't think of the term now. Uh, apprentice electricians in the electrical field, in the electrical industry. I, I believe the the ratio is two supervisors for one apprentice in the electrical field in the electrical industry, which is kind of backwards. Um, and then other ways in which we could increase the number of people in the in the industry, um, make it maybe a little easier to become an, a licensed engineer, or certified uh, surveyor, or something like that. Um, thanks. Thank you. I think, you know, <clears throat> that's certainly I see uh, clearly there's a direct uh, relationship with housing and housing construction there. I think we typically think of that type of policy in terms of, of economic development and provide, you know, from a jobs perspective. Uh, but I can see how it definitely relates to housing development as well. So that's something we, we can bring to our to the housing uh, advisory committee or our, our subcommittee and uh, and rec and suggest for them to consider. Hi, this is Amber again. Um, again, I find myself seeing that cost is lacking in these policies as well. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have perfect solutions for that. I do know that we are chasing our own work aged people out of our community because they can't afford to live here. Um, I don't know if we can implement some sort of incentivization for developers to, or even to buyers to make, to, if you're buying a single family residence, it needs to be your primary living residence. 
for a maximum or minimum of five years. I've seen that in cities, something to do with a rent cap. I don't know. I do know that I did a simple Google search today for a studio apartment. Something we can all agree on is a very good first apartment for someone first out on their first job. Um, one of the first ones I found on Grants Pass property management website, 795 a month for a studio apartment. Um, the federal recommendation is that you don't spend more than 30% of your income on rent. Um, 30% of someone making minimum wage. Um, that doesn't even come close. 30% for 795 a month is 31,800 a year. Someone making minimum wage is making 24,960 a year. So for a studio apartment, they couldn't even afford that. If you're making $15 an hour full time as a single person, you don't even afford that at 30%. And I also did a simple Google search for a studio apartment in downtown Portland and found one for $5 more. That allows pets. So cost is a huge issue. We were named the third most unaffordable housing market in the country. Little old Grants Pass, not San Francisco. I think they were number two. Why us? We have to figure out the rent. We have to, and we can't avoid it in all of this. We're not, I'm not seeing enough cost in any of this. I, I, I can't yeah. see you, Amber, so I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, no, I, thank you. Um, if you, if we can get your email, we, you know, we did hold, uh, we did, we did quite a bit of analysis on the rent burden issue and you're right that we're, we're, um, uh, you know, right around 63%, um, which is like, uh, in terms of the number of people that are severely rent burdened, um, those that are paying more than 50% of their household income for rent. Um, so, and, uh, there's a couple of different tools that that we're you know that we're looking at. Um, there's some some numbers which are kind of uh, not reflected you know in in this analysis. So you're you're right there. We do have that that information that's pretty up to date actually, um, since we we just did in January um, some kind of updated work on that. But it's going to take all of us uh, together. Uh, it really is. You know, um, it's everything from. On the city side, you know, what are those ways to kind of help reduce the cost to get them to get the new ones built? Um, but you know, we don't play a big role in 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 the managing the rental market. Uh, that's uh, not something that the state says that cities really do. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I can we can get you you know some some more information. But I think it's it's also coming to the housing advisory committee and kind of giving some feedback there. Yeah, I just, I, I worry that we're building a market for people that don't live here. You know, or even looking at your numbers earlier about how many people live in their in their dwelling as opposed to who are renting, it's way lower than the state average. We're sending our money to someone else's economy to be put somewhere else. We're, we're bleeding ourselves dry. Thank you, Amber. Out. Sure, come on up. So I, I have less of a question and maybe more of a comment is that I urge everyone on this committee to find a way to maybe address some of the problems that are causing our housing crisis. I, throughout this whole meeting, I'm not really sure why it's defined as a crisis. It, it seems like if it was a housing crisis, then people without houses would be a big deal. But it seems like we have a crisis of not very many homes, but for some reason, putting people in those homes isn't a big priority. Again, I, I urge everyone on this council to look at the underlying systemic issues in our economy that do this. Amber made so many good points about the rent just now. 
we we've seen more and more social systems being implemented all over the country. You can look at California. You can look at Stockton, California, that just recently had a universal basic income. I know that that's a different thing, but it's still a version of a sim. Uh, it's a social structure that could be implemented. And in our case, we could look at the free housing aspect of this. There's this notion that if we don't make money off of this, we're not doing it right. But it doesn't seem like that's going to put people in houses or actually solve this crisis. So maybe we could look at why grants pass unemployment is 5%, which is higher than the um, countries. We could look into why 60%, I think you said 60% are renters, right? We could look into why these things are happening. I really don't think that building more houses is just going to solve a problem when we have 5%, I believe it was 5.9% of homes are vacant. It doesn't seem like we have a crisis if we, it, it, it doesn't seem like this should be called a housing crisis. This should be called a lack of housing crisis. And I'm not sure that just building more houses is going to do anything when there are Lots and lots of systemic issues that need to be addressed. Sorry for rambling, but thank you. Thank you. See anyone else raising their hand online, Jason? Okay, so we're good, Steve. Okay, and <clears throat> I'll just echo what Brad said. I I, I appreciate those comments. I. I wish that uh, this small project could do more to, you know, address some of those uh, bigger bigger issues um, that people have brought up. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is just one small piece of what needs to be a comprehensive look at, you know, um, how to how to address the issue. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, those are all real critical issues that Grants Pass is going to need to face. And I appreciate, I mean, I'm glad this this meeting can be one forum for people to, to you know, continue to raise those issues. Um, so the last piece of tonight's uh, meeting, before I just talk quickly about where we're headed, is uh, looking forward to the next uh, piece of work that we're doing is really looking at these code updates related to um, middle housing into the housing needs analysis. Um, so um, as, as we wrap up the HNA, the next step is looking to implement measures to support the development of the housing that was identified in the plan, that housing needed housing. Um, the, the code, uh, the development code and the zoning code are one of the primary means of implementation uh, that address kind of what type of housing can be built and where, and ensuring that all needed housing um, is, a is at least accommodated. Again, the city doesn't um, have, have control over what gets built, but we want to make sure that the city doesn't have any policies or, or codes in place that are serving as barriers to seeing that, to ha that housing get getting built. Um, it's, it, code really sets the ground rules for what it's, what's possible to build. But it, and it works in tandem with a number of other regulatory and financial tools. And we showed a little bit of that in the housing policies like tax exemptions and, and permit and infrastructure fees and, and you know, all sorts of, um, you know, this thinking about what the city's role is in, in um, generating funding to, to support different types of um, more affordable housing. Um, again, ultimately it's that private market developers and consumers that shape what gets built on a given property. But hopefully um, these codes um, and the housing needs analysis, which which does include information identifying what the needs are at different income levels. Um, and these codes will be a small piece of, of helping helping address that issue. Um, so the city is looking at two separate code updates to address um, these housing needs. And uh, one is the clear and objective code update. And what this really does is um, uh, this effort began in 2018 and it's designed to address shortcomings in the current code to allow all needed housing types through clear and objective standards and review processes. So um, removing some of the subjective 
um, language that you might find in a code that that really um, at times can prevent uh, housing from being built. So having a clear simplified permitting process for all residential types and specific development standards for multi housing, uh, multi family housing that balance um, site design with neighborhood impacts. The project also expanded to address limiting low density residential uses in commercial zones to better support the commercial focus and intensity of those zones and focused low density housing in residential neighborhoods. Uh, this package was recently uh, reviewed by the Planning Commission and is headed to City Council for consideration. And then the other piece that I've mentioned that we're working on is the middle housing code update. Um, again, this comes directly from uh, House Bill, Oregon House Bill 2001. The code updates will add options for middle housing, including those types that I mentioned earlier in low and medium density zones to provide a greater variety beyond just single family detached homes to better meet the diverse housing needs that uh, Tim talked about earlier from in the HA. The code updates are currently in progress and will be the focus of our next public meeting, um, which will be in a few months. Um, and as part of uh, the drafting and adoption process that the city needs to complete by June 20, 2022 next year. Um, we'll look forward to engaging with you more and talking about some of the concrete steps that the city can take related to these housing opportunities. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to talk to you again um, at our next public meeting and we'll, that will be advertised um, just as this one was. In terms of next steps, I talked about them a bit, um, <clears throat> but here we are um, at the end of March with this public meeting, this purple star here. Our housing um, advisory committee subcommittee is meeting this Friday um, to talk more about the middle housing code. Um, and then uh, starting in May and June, uh, the advisory committee will meet one more time to make recommendations. Um, we'll also have a public meeting where we can review these middle housing code updates for duplexes and the other plexes and townhomes and cottage housing. So that's kind of what we're looking at between now um, and June and the end of June. Again, I posted the uh, the survey link here and I hope that people take the survey and share it with folks in your network so we can get make sure that the at least the policies, the framework for the city to take actions around these issues is comprehensive and covers all the topics that we talked about tonight. Um, that's all I have, um, Brad. Um, we can take I, more questions. I had mentioned earlier, I think Amber has to raise a question about the date of the city council meeting uh, for that next public hearing. It's April 21. Um, and that's um, the clear and objective code standards. It deals with multifamily apartment uh, design standards. And it also talks about um, uh, not, uh, not allowing single family housing in the general commercial zone. So that is at 6 p.m. April 21, right here in the council chambers. So that'll, that'll be a public hearing. Um, the uh, city council at this point hasn't been taking public comments um, online, so public comments would need to be made here in the in the chamber or in writing. Yeah. And there you are, Steve, live person. We can actually see you now on the big screen. I can see myself too. Do we have any other questions or comments for, for tonight? Certainly have time. You bet. One more. <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> I just really wanted to encourage anyone who has the power to, to look for any or think about any incentives or policies that could be enacted to encourage lower rent and prioritizing people having primary dwelling as opposed to renting out multiples of homes. Um, our renters are not graduating to homeowners here because the cost of rent is preventing them from saving up for a down payment or having good credit. So our new homeowners by and large are coming from out of state, out of area. And if we can lower the cost of rent and of housing in general, it will attract more employers and more jobs. 
nobody wants to bring their companies here if they can't have their employees live here. There's no incentive to bring an employer here like not having to pay your employees as much because rent is cheaper here. And that's not the case right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are going to uh, be capturing as much as the, uh, you know, the, all these comments as we can, and, and then this will be included into the, into the documents. The city council will get these. Um, um, and, you know, like I mentioned, we'll have a, we have a section on our website that talks about housing. And so, you know, they'll be put on there. Um, but uh, the real work, I think we all recognize, and I think Amber captured it well tonight, is, is really kind of outside this meeting hall. Um, and, uh, you know, having an effect with uh, lots of different areas from lenders um, to landlords to the state legislature and everywhere in between. So I think in the chamber we're good, Steve, unless you had anything else. No, I just uh, I really appreciate um, the comments that we heard tonight. Uh, we will. Um, we'll we'll work with you, Brad, to post uh, uh, the most current version of the housing needs analysis that we can. And uh, that that does include some of the economic information. It sounded like Tim was going to go back and see if he could answer a few questions that came up tonight. And if if Tim, if any additional information on income and affordability occurs to you that we can include in the final housing needs analysis. We'll work on that for the for that final version. Um, so thanks. Thanks for working on that, Tim. But for sure, let's get the updated uh, the current housing policies in that draft that Brad posts to the website and hopefully we can um, distribute to the folks who participated here tonight. Um, yeah, and just really thanks for all the the comments tonight we'll do our best you know for like i said for for what these projects are and what what they're designed to address we'll do our best um to be a part of that overall um effort to to address this you know really big problem especially in grants pass great thank you very much have a good evening Take care, thanks everyone mm -hmm.